I guess I'll probably all be that way, but anyway. Um, long novels, those of 700 pages or more, are making a comeback. At least that's the conclusion you would come to if you look at the book list from recent book fairs and publishers lists that they're publishing. For example, about a year ago, two publishing companies got in a bidding war over a novel that by Garth Risk Hallberg, his debut novel called City on Fire. 900 pages, this book is. And Knopf Publishing won the contract for him, pay, paying him just a little under $2 million for his transcript. Other books on the list recently include David Peace's Red or Dead, 720 pages, Diana Tartt's The Goldfinch, 784 pages, Eleanor Canton's um, The Luminaries, which are 832 pages, and then Richard House's The Kills, 1,002 pages. Now, the return of big books was good news if you're a type of person who likes to just sit down and relax with a long book, and that's if you like long tales, and you wanted some kind of counterbound counterbalance your Twitter feeds that you follow. At the same time, though, publishers, some of the publishers are saying, you know, these books, they're kind of bloated and they need some pruning on them. Reading long books is a wonderful experience if their stories can sustain the length of their tales. But if they can't sustain the story, it becomes a, a mind-numbing slog. If you're going to invest so much time in a book, says commentator Christy Gunn, you had better, it had better change us. Make us different than we were when we started. Make us bigger, somehow ourselves. I endorse her conclusion, but I would quickly add that a small, tightly written story can have the same powerful effect. It too can change us, make us different than when we started, make us bigger somehow ourselves. Case in point, the Gospel of Mark. Mark is famously brief. The shortest of the Gospels. Look at the seven verses that we have in our text tonight. In those seven verses, Mark covers the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, the beheading of John the Baptist, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry, and Jesus' mission statement. All in those seven verses. So quickly does Mark move from one incident to another in Jesus' life that his favorite word seems to be the Greek word elthos, immediately. He uses that word some 41 times in his gospel lesson. With only 16 chapters, Mark can be read by a determined reader in one sitting. Yet, in those brief chapters... Mark includes enough that if we didn't have Matthew, Luke, and John, we would still know who Jesus is and what he came to do. We'd have enough to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, for many years, some people, some biblical scholars have suggested that Mark was the first of the Gospels that was written, and that's probably the furthest thing from the truth. Mark reflects the preaching style of St. Peter, whom he followed. And the preaching style of St. Peter is much like Vicar Matt's preaching style, you know, rapid fire. He... <laughs> <laughs> he knows it. He knows it. We talk about it often. Um, Mark, even though he uses is lengthwise as short, his stories actually include more details than the stories in Matthew and Luke. Thus, filling out those things that we didn't know with just having Matthew and Luke. And at the same time, 
Mark often just simply alludes to his story, assumes the readers know the stories like he did with Jesus' baptism and with Jesus' temptations and the beheading of John the baptism. He, does, he doesn't rehearse the whole stories again. He just points them out because that helps him reach his conclusion quicker. Again, assuming you already know these stories. So Mark's purpose in writing this gospel was to change the reader. The way St. Peter's purpose in preaching was to change the hearer of those words. Peter and Mark both knew that God, through his word, can change the person, can work repentance and faith in that person. And so, that makes this gospel lesson ideal as the first lesson for the season of Lent. Why? Because in it, Mark captures the reason for Jesus' incarnation, the why of walking the way to the cross, and the what of the passion of our Lord. And Mark makes these points, big points, six of them that we need to hear and believe. The first point that Mark makes is that he identifies Jesus as the Son of God. Now, in Mark's day, the Son of God, um, if you look at the mythology of that time, the Son of God pointed to someone who was sent on a mission by God. So, you know, Hercules was the son of the god Zeus back then. For Jesus, Son of God literally meant that he was divine. It implied that Jesus was sent specifically by God to accomplish God's bidding here in, in this world. So Mark proclaims Jesus as the Son of God in the very first verse of his gospel, but then lets other people throughout the gospel confirm that identity. At the baptism of Jesus and at the transfiguration we heard last week, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. You have the demons whom Jesus casts out. They identify them. We know who you are. You're the Son of God. And Jesus says, be quiet to them. You have Jesus at his trial in which the high priest says, are you the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. And then at Jesus' death, a Roman centurion of all people says, truly this man was the son of God. We get the message. Mark is not telling us a story about some great man, some prophet, some hero He is telling us about God's specially sent Son who came to call people to repentance and faith because the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here now, he says. There's no time to waste. Repent and believe. The second point that he makes is that Mark declares Jesus to be the Messiah. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word for the Greek word Christ. They mean the same thing. It's the anointed one of God. And while a lot of this meaning has been lost to us in our day, what it does is it connects Jesus with the Old Testament promises, telling us that Jesus is the one that was promised long ago, who would save his people from their sins. And that aspect of Jesus' ministry is really important to us as we journey through the season of Lent. The third point that Marx makes is that that he recognizes Jesus as a unique teacher. He said that Jesus exudes authority when he teaches, not like their scribes. The scribes were the biblical scholars in those days. But when Jesus preached and taught, he exuded authority. His words had truth behind them because he was God in the flesh speaking to us, his people. When Jesus tells us that he came to save us from our sins, that promise is as sure as creation itself, as sure as the ground that we walk on. Fourth, Mark understands the ministry of Jesus is calling us to discipleship. Jesus says in Matthew 8, uh, 34, If anyone would be my follower, he must deny himself, 
take up his cross and follow me. And what he's saying there, to follow Jesus didn't mean just simply to fall in line with the rest of the people and walk wherever Jesus was leading them to. To follow Jesus means to be with Jesus in the same way Jesus is with us. The implication being, Jesus is saying, obey my heavenly Father as I obey my heavenly Father because the way to the cross is the way to everlasting life. Fifth, Mark shows Jesus' death was the will of God. You know, some people say it was just a perversion of justice. It could have been, but it was actually the will that Jesus die for us. Again, part of that thing that Mark does is adding details. So when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane praying, he says, nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. He understood that Jesus' death was God's will. And Mark wants us to know that this wasn't just a perversion of justice. It was a perfect person being sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. And the sixth point that Mark makes, he wants us to understand Jesus' death as an atoning act. Mark quotes Jesus again as saying, I have come not to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Clearly, Mark views Jesus' death as the seminal act of salvation history, of God's plan to rescue his people. And by that, Mark is saying, either you believe and are saved, or you reject it and are condemned. So knowing these six things about Jesus defines our Lenten journey, which we are just beginning. For in them, we find the whole plan of redemption. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, leads to repentance and faith. And God knows that we could not do that on our own. God couldn't trust us humans with a littlest part of our own salvation. Humans couldn't be trusted to even take the first step because as St. Paul says, we're dead in our sin. And a dead person cannot voluntarily move themselves. That's why God had to do it all in Jesus Christ. Jesus had to be the divine savior, to be the sinless sacrifice, to pay the price for the sins of the old world. Only Jesus could resist all the temptations of the devil. Only Jesus could usher in the reign and rule of the kingdom of God into this time, a a kingdom that's defined by grace and servanthood rather than power and coercion. Only Jesus could be trusted with walking the way of suffering to the cross. Lent is all about what Jesus did for us. The length, the breadth, the depth he was willing to suffer to save you and me. There was no shortcut in God's plan of salvation. No easy way to destroy death. God gave his very best to you and for you in Jesus Christ. And in Mark's galloping style of writing, we are told how Jesus came to bring us the good news, the gospel that must be preached and proclaimed in the world. Jesus came as servant so that our lives are different, are bigger, somehow ourselves, becoming servants like Christ. One other thing you might note about the Gospel of Mark is how it ends. Real abruptly, 16 verse 8, 
the women come to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. They're met by an angel who says, he's risen. The women in fear run away. And it stops right there. That's it. Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll see there's some verses afterwards, but you'll also note, and it'll also have a note there, that these verses were probably added by someone else and not Mark. Why did Mark do that? What was his purpose? To change the reader. And after marshalling all this evidence before us, Mark raises our emotional state to a point that says, choose. Do you believe that Jesus is the living Savior of the world, or do you not? Mark lets you end that story. Reading the gospel story of of Mark, that brief history of Jesus, does change us. It makes us different from when we started. It makes us bigger, somehow ourselves, because that's the power of God's word. The power that Mark says must be preached must be proclaimed. The power that Mark saw himself as he followed Peter and Paul in their missionary journeys. And it's that same word that goes with us as we journey through Lent. And that word changes us and enables us to be servants just like Jesus served us. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.